you're ready to go. Enjoy your session. Okay, thank you. So welcome to the blockchain session. So I'm Mark of Kohlweiss and I will be your co-chair together with uh, Juan Cohen. And I present the first uh, three or four talks because the, the, the last um, two talks are kind of, a, it's a joint talk for the, for the two papers on um, the Centrine broadcast. And oh, the, the, the two papers in the middle actually. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, and we, we will, um, Take questions after each talk, and um, both from Sulip and from from Zoom chat. So the first talk is uh, called "Can a Public Blockchain Keep a Secret?" by Fabrice uh, Ben Hamuda, Craig Chantry, Sergey Gurbanov, Shai Halevi, Hugo Kravcic, Cheng Yulin, Tal Rabin, and Leonid Resin. And Shai Halevi will give the talk. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, so that's the question. Can a public blockchain keep a secret? Um, and in this work, blockchain is just a synonym for a very large distributed system with only a broadcast channel. So if you want to say anything to anybody, you have to broadcast it and it's authenticated broadcast. Everybody know that you said it. the goal, the high level goal of this uh, work is we want to be able to use this blockchain as a compute platform and for us cryptographer a compute platform is just a trusted third party um and the question is can we actually use a public blockchain as a trusted third party and the answer today is not really i mean blockchains today public blockchains are great if what you care about is integrity or agreement or immutability but if you want to compute on data that could be secret, well, everything is public. So that's not a great thing. So the focus of this work is secrecy. And in particular, since we're thinking of a blockchain as a very large distributed system, we want to have a design that works even if you have very many nodes. So we want a design that can extend uh, for thousands or, hun or hundreds of thousands or millions of nodes. As many nodes as you throw at it, it should still work. The setting that we address in this work is the most basic of secrecy uh, setting. We ask can a blockchain keep a secret? And by that we mean, think of a client of the blockchain that would deposit a secret with the blockchain and ask that the secret be revealed only when the time is right. So for example, I'm gonna publish a puzzle that everybody can try to solve. I'm gonna give the blockchain the solution to that puzzle and tell the, blo tell the blockchain, well, if nobody solves it by next week, please publish the solution. Uh, our goal are secrecy and efficiency. So secrecy is obvious. The adversary cannot learn the secret before it, it is published. Uh, and importantly, security should hold even against the mobile adversary that can corrupt one node today and then another node tomorrow, etc. cetera. Uh, and efficiency, the main efficiency consideration is scalability. As I said, we want a design that extends no matter how many nodes you have in the system. Uh, so in particular, the communication, the number of broadcast messages among focus bits should not grow with the number of nodes in the network. Another uh, efficiency consideration that we have, it's not uh, well defined, but uh, we want to have it anyway, which I call plausible practicality. Practicality, Essentially what I mean is don't use obfuscation or witness encryption or things like that. We want to use uh, run on the mill uh, primitives instead. Uh, we're going to use a solution, a secret solution that's based on dynamic, proactive secret sharing. What that means is that at any given point in the life of the system, the secret would be shared among a small committee, and these committees will change. So every day or every week, uh, we're going to have a, a reshare protocol by which the old committee passes the share to the new committee and then erases its own shares. Uh, this is to defend against a mobile adversary that corrupts one node today and another tomorrow. Uh, the feature of it should be that as long as the adversary cannot corrupt a majority of any of the committees, as long as all these committees have honest majority, you're fine even if throughout the life of the system there isn't any single node that's never corrupt. Uh, and the main technical challenge in a system like us, where you only have a broadcast channel is consider a mobile adversary that has some corruption budget. So you assume that the adversary never corrupts more than say 25% of the nodes in the system. 
but we want a scalable solution. So our committees are going to be much, much smaller than 25% of all the nodes in the system. So the adversary has enough budget to corrupt the entire committee. And the way we're going to go about it is we're going to try to make it so that the adversary doesn't know who the current committee is, so it cannot target them for corruption. And the technical challenge here is exactly that. How can the committee do its job without the adversary learning who they are? In our case, the job of the committee is very simple. Just keep the secret and then pass it to the next committee. Uh, but how can you do that without the adversary ever learning who's in the committee? The solution that we have... Uh, is built essentially as having two phases. Uh, and we're going to have two types of committee. We have uh, what we call a nominating committee. Those guys don't know any secrets, and their job is just to select the secret sharing committee. And then we have the secret sharing committees that actually know the secrets. Uh, and the protocol uh, accordingly consists of two parts. The nominating committee self-selects. These guys don't need to know any secret, so they can choose themselves to the committee. This is a fairly standard trick uh, in blockchains these days, so they can use verifiable random functions, for example, to do that. Uh, and once I chose myself to be a nominator uh, using my VRF, uh, I can choose another random nominee from the big N parties, and I'm going to establish what we call a target anonymous channel to it. This is a channel where everybody can send message to that party without needing to know who that party is. And you can establish channels like that using public key uh, anonymous public key encryption. And once all of these channels are in place, then the old committee can see that these channels are in place and then use them to send mess to pass the secret to the next committee without needing to know who the next committee is. So this is the uh, high level of how the solution works. The end result is a scalable evolving committee proactive secret sharing protocol. The resilience is not as high as we would like it. Essentially, uh, it only resilience again, are resilient against a mobile adversary controlling at most about a quarter, a little more than a quarter of the nodes. Uh, and the reason is that the adversary in this uh, setting has a double dipping strategy where if the nominator is bad, then it will choose a bad nominee. And if the nominator is good, then it will choose the nominee at random. And again, with some probability, it will be bad. Uh, this protocol can conceivably be made practical. In particular, we only use uh, hardness assumptions that we know and love, like DDH, DCR, LW, et cetera. Um, one point to make is that it requires anonymous encryption under selective opening attacks. Uh, and there is an open problem there where the standard uh, run-of-the-mill anonymous public encryption remain anonymous under selective opening attacks. For secrecy, we know that the answer is no. For anonymity, we conjecture that the answer is yes. And we actually prove it for an interesting special case, a uh, case of uh, a class of adversaries for which already secrecy doesn't hold, but anonymity does. Uh, bottom line is the architecture and the techniques are broadly applicable. So once you can uh, keep a secret, you can also compute on a secret. So you can use it to do secure on PC on a public blockchain. And you can use that, for example, for the blockchain can sign. So there'll be a committee that signs on behalf of the blockchain or decrypt or compute or even obfuscate. Uh, so by and large, these techniques can be used uh, to treat a public blockchain as a trusted party. And that's it. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for a nice presentation. Um, so is, are there any questions in the audience? I don't see raised hands. Um, one is checking uh, Sulip. So I will, I will, I will ask the, the first question maybe while others come up with questions. So, um, so um, my, my question is like, what are, are there any obstacles um, for doing like general multi-party computation in this style? So why did you choose this very simple um, problem or do you have security proofs for more? No, there, no, actually we have follow-up works for doing a general secure computation. Uh, this was just a very handy tool for figuring out how to do things. When we started, it wasn't clear to us that, uh, that anything short of witness encryption will give you that. Uh, so we needed some place to, you know, we needed a playground to play and that was, that seemed to be a good playground. Uh, there aren't, uh, major obstacles for uh, 
extending it to general secure computation, it's not completely trivial because the nature of computation it is, is that you only need to uh, broadcast, you can only broadcasting and communication is only one way, uh, but there aren't um, big obstacles to doing the generic secure computation once you have a way of choosing the committees. Uh, making the resilience larger than a quarter is a little more problematic. And actually we have a sort of follow-up work that does that. It gets, gets you a, a quarter, uh, sorry, up to a half, any constant strictly less than a half. Uh, but that seems a little more problematic. And then, you know, there are no, no major barriers. So, but it's just... There's another question by Ran Canetti. Do you assume a PKI? or a way to identify players? If not, then how do you deal with authentication? So yes, we assume a PKI. In particular, the broadcast channel is an authenticated broadcast channel. So PKI is sort of trivial because I can always broadcast another uh, uh, key. And then everybody would know that I broadcast another key. And even if I'm corrupted, once I recover, I have access to PKI to broadcast another key. So. Okay, so there's also a question from Benny Applebaum. Uh, Benny, uh, do you want to ask personally? If you can try that, but of course we can ask the question. But if you just, and it probably you can't, right? So uh, sure, no, I'm yeah. just asking. Uh, um, assuming that you have private channels, is there a hope to do it uh, under symmetric assumptions while keeping the the low uh, communication overhead? So we actually we have well. Are you going to give me also a broadcast in addition to... <laughs> to sure, sure. Broadcast is for free. So we, ha we have an information theoretic uh, thing, assuming honest majority, an information theoretic uh, thing that uh, uses both the, the private channels and the, uh, um, and the uh, uh, broadcast channel. It's not particularly complicated if you're assuming corruption less than a quarter. If you assume corruption less than a half, then it's also doable, but it's hard. Okay, cool. So maybe we can take more questions at the end. Um, yeah, so let's have the second speaker um, set up. And uh, so the second talk is on, um, as, yeah, so thanks, thanks uh, Shai for, for the talk. Um, so the, Next speaker is uh, Joan Wan. Uh, the talk is on expected constant round present in broadcast under this honest majority. And um, Joan will also present the paper after that on round efficient present in broadcast under strong adaptive and majority corruptions. Um, I suspect in a joint talk, um, we see how that goes. So that the speakers of the first talk is Joan, uh, the, the, the authors of the first paper are John Wan, Han Shen Xiao, Ellen Shi, Srini Devadas. And the second, I will also present the second um, paper or add the second paper. So the second paper um, is by Xuan Wan, Han Shen Xiao, Srini Yaban, Devadas, and Ellen Shi. So I think it's the same authors but in slightly yeah. different order. Okay, cool. So the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. So today I want to talk about uh, this Byzantine broadcast under dishonest majority. So let's, wait uh, a second. Let's consider the problem is that we want to decide whether TCC will be virtual this year. How this is going to work is that uh, the chair is going to make a decision and it's going to send the decision to everyone. So the first thing we want to satisfy is validity. This means, you know, when the chair is honest, everyone should agree on the chair's decision. This should hold even in the presence of uh, malicious participants, maybe whose uh, paper gets rejected and wants to mess up the process. So, but this is not always the case, right? So what if uh, the chair is dishonest? There is a possibility that the chair's paper gets rejected as well. So he might sense, you know, the program is virtual to Alice and Bob, Send that TCC will be in Boston this year to Carl and Dan. To make things even more complicated, uh, the chair and Eve might be co author So they're working together to mess up this process. So the second property we want to satisfy is that 
consistency, even when the chair is dishonest, everyone should still agree. It doesn't matter what they agree on, but you know, they should agree on the same thing. So this is the Byzantine broadcast problem. And under synchronous setting, Dolop and Strong shown that no deterministic protocol can achieve Byzantine broadcast within F plus one rounds. Here F is the number of corrupt users. This is uh, saying no to deterministic protocol, but if we consider randomized protocol, then there were some beautiful results. So we know that on, under honest majority, we have expected constant runs protocol, even under adaptive adversary. However, for dishonest majority, this area of work is uh, much harder. Garrett et al. and Fis et al. first solved the problem by presenting a solutions with um, 2f minus n square complexity and later improved to 2f minus n. So this is, uh, the limitation for this work is that they are interesting only when f is very close to half n. So it still doesn't solve the question whether there exists sublinear round protocol. This is later improved by Chen et al. recently to polylog complexity. However, it still doesn't match the expected constant rounds complexity we have seen under honest majority. So in this work, we present a Byzantine broadcast protocol whose round complexity is approximately like n square divided by n minus f square. This is just like n square divided by the number of honest users square. So this is constant as long as the number of honest users is linear in the number of total users. So we want to present some of the interesting ideas in this paper. One of them is the, the idea it's called the trust graph. Each user maintains a trust graph and as the name implies, it's, uh, it tries to indicate the trust relationship between different, two different users. The set of vertices is just the users and an edge exists if and only if we think these two users trust each other. So you can see in this example here, this is the user's original trust graph. After thinking that you know, this black node might be corrupt, it will remove the edge between itself and the black node. Okay. Of course, this is a Byzantine setting, so we cannot guarantee that users have consistent trust graph. In fact, having consistent trust graph is just as hard as Byzantine broadcast itself. So we allow each users to maintain its own trust graph and the trust graph might be different. And the intuition for this is that, you know, uh, even though not all misbehavior leave behind cryptographic evidence, but hopefully at least we can learn something from it. Let's say if a user U uh, accuse another user V, there are two possibilities right here, right? The first one is U is telling the truth and V is indeed corrupt. But the second one, is like U is corrupt, he receives the message from V, but he intentionally dropped the message and try to frame V for it. What you can observe is that in, bo in both of these cases, at least one of U and V must be corrupt. So in some sense, even though we cannot figure which of them is corrupt, we can still keep track of this information and make use of it. If let's say we gather enough accusation, maybe F plus one accusation on a user V, then we know that at least one of them have to come from an honest users and we know that we must be corrupt. So our first interesting idea is to come up with a trust graph maintenance scheme and it will keep track of this type of information. Honest user will always be fully connected and we make sure that the diameter of the trust graph is less than number of honest, uh, total users divided by number of honest users. Our second interesting idea is to implement a primitive, it's called the trust cast. This is similar to reliable broadcast or great cast. It's not consensus itself, but we can bootstrap uh, consens full consensus from it. Uh, the difference from trust cast with uh, primitive, primitive is that it's strongly re related to the trust graph idea we just talked about. It uses the trust cast idea, in trust graph idea in between, and the ground complexity is actually equal to the diameter of the trust graph. So this allows us to outbound the diameter to constant. So combining these two, we can create a Byzantine broadcast protocol under dishonest majority. The, we, are, we are going to call the trust cast protocol constant number of times. So the final round complexity is still constant. Uh, the communication complexity on the, hand, on the other hand is slightly larger, it's n to the fourth. So it's, uh, it's like it still needs improvement. Now this brings us to the second part of the, top, of the talk. Uh, the second paper is Byzantine broadcast under strongly adaptive and majority corruption. The previous paper only worked for a weakly adaptive adversary. 
Before that, let's first talk about the different adversary models we consider. Usually we consider the adversary model in Bison King setting. The first one is static adversary, which is the weakest model. A user needs to decide which corrupt before the protocol. Once the protocol begins, they cannot do anything to corrupt new users. So a weakly adaptive adversary, as we have considered in the last paper, is that you can corrupt any user at any time of the protocol. However, if you corrupt a user in round R, then any message sent by that user before the corruption must be safely delivered. So this creates uh, a problem for the adversary because if you have, you sometimes you need to look at the message before it decides who to corrupt, right? And by the time of corruption, that message will already been delivered. So sometimes it'll become a conflicting cases for the adversary. The strongly rushing adaptive, adaptive adversary is the strongest of all. It can erase the message a user sent in the round of corruption. So this is why protocols that use leader election or a committee tricks does not usually work in strongly rushing adaptive adversary. They can't just observe who the leader is and just corrupt the leader right away. So our question in this paper is to whether it's possible to achieve sublinear round complexity under dishonest maturity and a strongly rushing adaptive adversary. Our intuition on the high level is that how it, we wonder if it is possible to just reduce a strongly rushing adaptive adversary to a weakly one. So if there exists some trick such that adversary cannot corrupt users before the message are delivered, then we will be good, right? So our idea is to encrypt the message. If the adversary needs at least one round of time to decrypt the message, then, then by the time you figure out who's sending the message, the message will already be delivered. So this is the part where we use the time lock puzzle. On the high level, a time lock puzzle is, uh, is a scheme that allows you to generate a puzzle in a short amount of time. You can solve it in T steps, but you cannot solve it really much faster than that. So what if we just combine the time lock puzzle with the, let's say, existing Bison team broadcast protocol directly? Well, the challenge here is that adversary has access to unbounded parallel machines, but honest users don't. So suppose everyone is sending a message through a time lock puzzle. Then adversary can solve all in puzzles using parallel machine really fast. But honest users have to solve them one by one, right? So this is the challenge here. And even if we want to distribute the workload among honest users, this is really hard because they don't have a consistent view of the puzzle being distributed. Adversary can rush in a lot of puzzles at the very end, and this will create a trouble. So our solution to this is to propose an H-based sampling protocol. It basically fulfills what we just mentioned. It allows each user to distribute a time-lock puzzle embedding some message. And at the end, every honest user will receive the solution of all honest puzzles. And the adversary cannot learn any information just within one round of time. We use the H-based sampling because um, like honest user, we, we, in the end, we make sure that they only solve polylogarithmic number of puzzles. So the round complexity is also polylogarithmic. And this is, uh, the H-based sampling protocol is an uh, interesting protocol by itself. It can be combined with a lot of existing protocol to solve the problem under strongly rushing adaptive adversary. So in the end, we just combine this with Chen et al's work to get full compliance broadcast. Notice that this step is also non-trivial because uh, the security proof is really challenging. We have to do a lot of uh, hybrid argument. So in conclusion, in these two papers, we present, presented two Bison broadcast protocols. The first one is uh, expected constant runs under weekly adaptive adversary. The second one is uh, polylog rhythmic number of runs under a strongly rushing adaptive adversary. And the th three interesting independent protocols is the trust graph ideas, the trust cast protocol, and the H-based sampling protocol. However, it's still an open question whether we can achieve Byzantine broadcasts under a strongly ad adaptive adversary in expected constant runs. This is a challenging problem, and I hope someone can solve it in the future. And uh, in the end, this is my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, so are, um, are there any, any questions from in the audience or on Sulik? So um, while people come up with questions, so I have I have a question on, on the trust graph. So it's, this is a kind of a really cool new technique. Have you, have you thought about any other applications 
of, of that technique or maybe the other uh, two techniques that you mentioned? Uh, okay, and that's a really good question. So for the trust graph, um, I think it's, um, it's, it can be generalized to other problems. For example, um, currently we're still thinking, you know, if we can also use it to solve problems in relative to communication complexity of bright taking broadcast. And besides that, you know, it's, it's something that stores the trust relationship, right? So it's not just uh, restricted to bright agreement. I think uh, it might be used in other MP MPC problems. So yeah. Yeah. As, uh, also, for, as for the other two, like the trust cast thing is uh, very similar to trust graph. So it's basically uh, whatever just said applies to the trust cast as well. The age-based sampling stuff, um, it can be used in a lot of protocols to generalize from a weakly adaptive adversary to a strongly rushing adaptive adversary. So besides Chen et al's work, for example, our phase first paper, you can also use this age-based sampling trick to make it strongly adaptive adversary. But you know, if you use it, the H-based sampling protocol requires login runs complexity. So it's no longer uh, an expected constant runs protocol. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. okay. We have uh, more questions in the chat. So we have a question by Frank Davis. How does this technique compare to speeds and speeds to K? Uh, yeah, so, and maybe if, if Frank, maybe you can give more details if that's necessary, but Shall I stop the screen share so that I can look at the chat? Okay. Sure. Okay. So I just think that there's, there's been a lot of approaches in this space regarding uh, a dishonest majority. And just curious on how th this approach um, kind of compares with, with, with those other approaches. Well, so I think the, the difference is that, um, so first of all, it's, it's uses, it's completely based on this idea called trust graph. And um, the high level structure is similar to um, the actual Byzantine broadcast protocol. The structure is like the proposed a vote and then commit structure, which is similar to what we have seen in Abraham et al's paper. And however, the core idea is completely about uh, the trust graph. It's like using the trust graph to detect malicious users and to stop them from uh, being effective and you know keep confusing honest users. So this, on the second paper, I think uh, the core idea is about this uh, H-based sampling protocol. It's about like using time lock puzzles and to to restrict the power of the strongly adaptive history. So I would say the main difference with our paper is that we care more about you know figuring out who is the corrupt users and you know adapting our protocol to restrict their power. And yeah, I think that is the key idea here. Thanks. Uh, okay. Okay. So okay. there's a bit more discussion in the chat and maybe the, the can you continue the discussion on that question also in Sulip. Any more questions? Maybe one more question. So there's a question by Juan that uh, I think Elaine has answered. Maybe um, Juan, do you want to ask again? So it would be online. Yeah, the first result seems to be uh, arbitrary polynomial time hmm, parties. And for the time lock puzzles, you need uh, like T bounded type adversaries. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think uh, the adversary uh, for the first for the first one is just a weekly adaptive adversary. The adversary has to be like, uh, like only have finite computation powers. And yeah, it has to be like PPT and T bounded. Hi, hi, Jun. This is Elaine. So actually, the we don't have a t-bounded assumption. So it, it's like probabilistic polynomial work, and then it it can have unbounded parallelism. So like in some steps of the proof, we need to use the fact that it cannot break this uh, time lock puzzle by this time, but the the final result actually doesn't have any constraint on on the adversary's running time. Okay. Yeah. 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 I was talking about the the first paper. Yeah, the second one is like Elaine. So, so what is what is by this time? Is this arbitrary polynomial or you have a bound? So even though you have a you know I'm on the par parallelism, then you have a bound for the puzzle, right? It's not arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's definitely uh computation power it's is finite. It's just uh it can't have parallel machine.
Okay, um, cool. So let's uh, thank Juan for for two very nice talks. So then the next talk, um, the speaker can already start up the screen sharing. Um, so the next talk is on blockchains from non-idealized hash functions by Juan Gawe, Agolos Kiaios, and Georgos Panagiotakas. And Georgos will give the talk. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> uh, can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Great, thanks. Okay, so um, the main characteristic of uh, blockchain protocols is that transactions are organized in blocks and blocks are organized into chains. And these protocols were made popular starting with Bitcoin in 2008. And uh, Bitcoin used the structure to implement what's called a robust transaction ledger, a notion developed through a series of papers. Now, the reason this, this uh, protocols are interesting is because um, they operate in what's called a permission setting. Now, while in the classical setting, uh, participants should first register, for example, using a PKI to take part in the protocol and communication is authenticated. In the permission setting, uh, anyone can join the protocol and uh, parts communicate using some kind of gossip mechanism and communication is not authenticated. Now, uh, this obviously this uh, setting is quite challenging as anyone can join the protocol and the adversary can launch uh, simple attacks. And that's the reason why uh, most classical protocols fail in this setting because they uh, require honest majority of parties and with a simple attack this can be uh, easily overthrown. Now, uh, the solution Bitcoin uh, proposes is to make participation costly using proof of work and then uh, leverage this, uh, this tool by assuming that the majority of computational power uh, belongs to honest parties. Now, there have been also other approaches like uh, proof of space time, but I should note here that in this work, we do not consider proof of stake protocols since uh, they require an initial registration phase. Now, most uh, proof of um, proof of work, proof of work based uh, blockchains are has based. Are uh, the proof of work mechanism is has based, and the same uh, thing holds for proof of space time. And the way these protocols are analyzed is uh, using the random oracle methodology, where uh, the has function is replaced with a random oracle, and then the analysis proceeds. Now, we know that the random oracle methodology is not sound and should only be used as a sanity check. So uh, the following question arises: whether uh, we can base the security of these protocols on a set of properties for non-idealized hash functions. And we answer this question in the affirmative by showing that there exists a secure blockchain protocol, assuming the existence of a non-idealized hash function that satisfies a set of three simple properties that I describe next, the existence of uh, uh, NISCs, and an adversary that controls at most one third of the computational power. Now, in the process, we also introduce uh, uh, the notion of iterated search problems, which is a class of hard problems, uh, uh, which are similar to iterated sequential functions, but allow for, uh, but allow for parallelization. Um, okay. Now, the three hash function properties we, we assume are the following. Uh, first, collision resistance is a standard property for hash functions. Uh, secondly, uh, the hash function should be a computational weak extractor. Again, this property has been studied in the past for hash functions. And thirdly, uh, we introduce a new assumption, which is called t traded hardness, which basically says that it should be hard to generate a sequence of k small hashes in less than k times t steps. Uh, okay. Now, the main technical issues we, we had to face to construct our protocol uh, was first that uh, in the protocol execution, the adversary will also see honest computer blocks. And uh, in order to not make our uh, iterated hardness assumption very strong, we do not assume that the adversary has any, any such powers. He cannot see uh, small hashes for free. So somehow we should be able to simulate uh, this, uh, the honestly computed blocks. And secondly, the, it may be the case that the proof of work uh, we construct may be witness malleable because if you, if you think about the um, iterated hardness assumption, it only says that it should be hard to generate uh, 
k small highs k small hashes in a sequence in a sequence it's, it may not be hard to generate uh, small hashes on the same level let's say now the way we deal with this issue is by embracing uh, proof of work malleability so what we do is that we uh, uh, use bitcoins uh, uh, Proof of work construction, but we reverse it. We require the first hash to be smaller than the target instead of the second. This way, we preserve hardness. But on the other hand, uh, this proof of work is explicitly witness malleable in the sense that if you change the second part of the witness, W1 prime here, you get another valid uh, proof of work for free. Now, of course, this does not solve uh, does not solve our problems because uh, the adversary can again compute a new block cheaply by uh, after he sees an honestly computed block by changing this w1 prime part so what we do is that is that we uh, use uh, simulation extractable NISCs to hide the witness and with all these changes we're able to actually uh, simulate uh, honest blocks in our protocol by using the NISC simulator and the fact that the hash function is an extractor and following these techniques we manage to uh, prove security as i said now, a number of open questions remain from our work. First, whether we can reduce this iterated hardness assumption to simpler, more well-studied uh, uh, assumptions, whether we can use techniques from analysis to attack the iterated hardness property for specific hash functions, like the one used in Bitcoin, and whether we can achieve security against an adversary controlling uh, close to one half of the computational power under the same assumptions. Our work only goes up to one third. And that's most of what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Georgos, uh, for a nice talk. So um, are there questions in the audience? Yes, yes. there's a question by Ivan Visconti. Ivan, do you want to talk? Do you want to ask it yourself? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah so the question is, uh, where do you pick the CRS for needs, since uh, you cannot use a random oracle? Yeah, so, so we assume a fresh CRS as in the Bitcoin analysis. We assume that uh, uh, parties and the adversary get access to a CRS at the same time, similar to the fresh uh, Genesis block assumption, let's say, in, uh, in Bitcoin. Thank you. And just a follow up question Can you also think of replacing the uh, needs with an interactive, let's say, publicly verifiable uh, zero knowledge? Perhaps interactive, but uh, where interaction is with the blockchain rather than with uh, a verifier. Um, well, it's, it's I haven't thought about it. I understand. So, yeah, I haven't thought about it. So, yeah, I mean, well, the only part of the question is: Do you re really need the non-interaction for the for the needs? Oh, yeah, probably. I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe so we will change out of line. Yeah, in this in the blockchain setting, you know, since you don't have identities. Being non-interactive makes things easy. You just publish your block and your non-interactive proof. Now, adding interaction, well, if it's with the blockchain, I'm not sure how, how it will work, but yeah, definitely an interesting question. Thanks a lot. Okay, there's another question by Alexander. Alexander, you want to ask it? Oh, sure. Um, maybe you mentioned this and I missed it. Um, is it easy to say where the one third adversary constraint um, arises in the current picture or is that somehow buried, you know, deep inside the proof? Well, um, I can give a high level answer, which is uh, during our reduction from an attacker against our blockchain protocol to an attacker against this uh, iterated hardness uh, assumption property. Uh, we can only take advantage of only one adversarial block per uh, three level. Think of Bitcoin, let's say, structure, structurally. Um, in our reduction, we can only take advantage of one block at the time, at, at the time which kind of per, per three level, which makes things a bit hard to get one half. So we, we know where, where the problem is, but we don't know how to fix it at the moment. And actually, it's an interesting question whether we can actually fix it with this assumption, whether this uh, iterated hardness assumption that allows for malleability on the, on the same level, whether this is sufficient to get you to one half. That's, I think that's a very interesting question. Thanks. OK, cool. Any, any more questions? Thank you. I have one question, um, and 
maybe it's it's kind of a hard one, but I, I want to ask it. So so you you show that uh, this um, iterated search problem if can be reduced to Bitcoin, right? So what about the other direction? Is there any hope of proving Bitcoin secure under standard assumptions? And yeah, what's your what's your take on that? Yeah, so I guess what, what you mentioned something from the full talk is that we saw that um, the iterate hardness property is uh, necessary to prove Bitcoin secure. And that's why we believe that there is some evidence uh, in favor of this uh, assumption. Uh, but so we saw the other way around in the sense that we uh, start from iterated hardness and the extra assumptions and uh, we go to we, we prove Bitcoin secure. Now going uh, um, Deeper than that, I'm not. I'm not sure. So that that's one of our open questions: whether we can uh, uh, reduce the hardness to some more standard assumptions. Do you show Bitcoin secure, or you show your adapted blockchain protocol secure? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, our adapted blockchain protocol secure. Like, which of the adaptations can you take away again to get like something that's maybe more practical or more, more like Bitcoin? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, so the main adaptation is that uh, this thing I said that we uh, change the protocol so we can uh, simulate honest blocks. Mm -hmm. um, if we rely on, on this uh, type of hardness assumption that does not have any trapdoors, I don't see how we can uh, mm -hmm. we can avoid this. We should be able to simulate honest blocks. That now, if you don't have any trapdoors, if you're if this is a more traditional, let's say, hash function that doesn't have any trapdoors, I'm not sure how you can avoid that. But may, maybe you can go to other assumptions where you can have trapdoors and, and things get easier. I'm not, I'm not sure. OK, cool. So, so I will now hand over to Juan for the remaining talks of the session. So the next talk is about ledger combiners for first settlement. This is by Matthias Fitzi, Peter Gazi, Agalos Kiaias, and Alexander Assel. And Alexander would give the talk. Okay, great. Um, hopefully you can hear me and also see my see my slides. Um, okay, super. So um, probably most or uh, all of you uh, in the audience um, uh, are already experts on Nakamoto consensus. And the um, big takeaway here is that um, it's awesome, but, um, but it's slow. Um, so Nakamoto consensus has all kinds of nice properties, um, simple, it's super flexible. You can adapt it to a whole family of various leader election mechanisms. And this yields you know, solutions in um, all kinds of wonderful settings like the permissionless setting or settings with um, dynamic availability. Um, uh, on the other hand, at a kind of fundamental level, the the longest chain style Nakamoto consensus framework itself naturally frustrates latency. And the issue here is that the way that, that um, settlement occurs in Nakamoto consensus, um, the way that we achieve consistency that is, is to take a transaction bearing block and get a whole bunch of follow-up blocks to be stacked on top of it. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, the basic mechanics of the system um, basically limit the block, the block production like uh, the, the, the block production rate by um, uh, by network delays. So if block production, you know, significantly exceeds network delays, then you end up with forks that, you know, threaten the security of the of the system. So the goal of the, the talk is to try to accelerate Nakamoto consensus. And um, the basic idea is to explore the power of running a bunch of simultaneous, um, hopefully more or less independent instances of a blockchain or a Nakamoto consensus mechanism. So um, what's in the paper, we, um, we formulate an abstract model that's supposed to capture how consistency accrues in the Nakamoto setting, which we call a dynamic ledger. And we point out that typical blockchains like you know, Bitcoin, for example, um, automatically yield this abstract object called a dynamic ledger. And um, all of that is really designed to 
let us uh, formulate a latency reducing black box construction. So it's a black box construction that takes in some, you know, M independent ledgers or blockchains um, and produces um, a new ledger or blockchain that, um, that offers improved latency. So I say um, roughly independent uh, here, and I should add that you know I, one of the contributions of the work is to say something sort of precise about what kind of independence you really need between these constituent um, blockchains or ledgers in order to achieve um, uh, improved latency. So um, a couple of conclusions um, to advertise. So one is, that by um, you know by applying this combiner or you know this this construction with a number of blockchains that actually scales with the security parameter of the system, you can achieve something interesting. You can achieve a POW um, you know blockchain infrastructure that um, provides settlement guarantees that are constant time. Um, to put a little bit of a finer point on this, it really only provides constant time settlement for, for conflict-free transactions. Um, so what does that mean? Um, transactions settle no matter what. So all transactions will eventually settle. In the worst case, they end up settling with time that has to do with a kind of worst case settlement time and the underlying ledgers that you're combining. On the other hand, if you inject a transaction and there's a, um, a short window of time, a, a constant width period of time, during which no conflicting transactions are injected, then it will settle quickly and it will settle in, in constant time. Um, a few more sort of interesting notions or interesting features of the construction. Um, the first is that acceleration is under user control. So by that, I mean, um, uh, if you have taken a family of your favorite blockchains and applied this construction to those blockchains, then if users choose, they can just inject their transaction into um, one of the blockchains, it will eventually settle. If they wanna take advantage of this possibility of accelerated settlement, um, then they can inject their transaction into all of the blockchains. And in a situation where you imagine that, you know, you have to pay a little bit to inject in a blockchain, this achieves a kind of nice sort of trade-off between like cost and, and settlement time. Um, uh, assuming that the underlying blockchains um, allow sort of flexible enough transactions to be injected into them, this also has um, the somewhat nice conclusion that the constituent blockchains or ledgers themselves don't even need to know they're taking part in the, in the construction. So there's no explicit coordination that needs to take place between them. The, um, uh, the construction itself is a sort of deterministic rule that takes a view given to you by M existing ledgers or blockchains and turns it into a new like virtual ledger or um, uh, blockchain. And uh, I mentioned this before, you know, part of what we do in the paper is to try to be precise about um, how much independence you need between these, con these, con these constituent objects in order for that construction to work. So I would just like to say um, a few words about what the actual analytic challenge is here. Um, and at, at a fundamental level, what you would like to do is give a rule for turning like M linear orders into a single linear order. Um, and if you wanna do this, you're gonna have to answer questions um, like the one that's, that's posed visually on this slide, which is you've got a transaction that appears in the you know, red blocks on your left, and you've got a transaction that appears in the yellow blocks on your right, which one wins? You know, which one appears first in the ledger? And to um, you know, turn up the heat a little bit, you can kind of answer, kind of um, you know, really imagine that the most critical question is something like this. Um, you know, how are you going to be able to compare the thing on the left with the with the thing on the right? And um, I won't describe the answer in any detail, um, but I will say that we sort of formulate this as a notion of um, as a rank function. You should think about the rank for Bitcoin as um, um, as the you know height of the block in which the transaction appears, and the goal is to take um, ranks from M existing you know blockchains and turn them into a new rank function that has the that has the right properties. 
One interesting um, sort of structural takeaway from the work is that it turns out that the rank function that works looks very like the functions that arise in regret minimization, which is, which suggests that maybe there's a deeper a deeper connection here. And instead of talking about the actual like structure of the rank function, I would just like to end the talk with a kind of combinatorial cartoon about what's really happening here. You know um, how. Um, the rank function, you know, is really determining who comes first. And the basic features go something like this. Um, so first of all, we use preemption, which is to say that um, if I am trying to figure out how much an individual blockchain contributes for a, um, a family of conflicting transactions, you know, only the first one of say a pair of conflicting transactions gets to claim that ledger for its own. So this is a kind of preemption. Um, the second critical ingredient is that there's a kind of window of consideration. So if I'm um, trying to evaluate between two transactions, which one is going to appear first, uh, what I do is I roll back in time to the moment where the, um, the, where the first occurrence of either of these appeared. I then lop off a window of a certain length L and using preemption inside that window, I kind of use um, census to determine who wins. And uh, in fact, if you look at the actual rank function we use, it's some kind of smoothification of this combinatorial of this combinatorial cartoon. In this case, um, in this case, yellow wins. And what are the salient features of all of this that we really wanted at the end of the day? Um, well, there is a parameter involved in the basic construction, which is L, which sort of gives you this trade-off between, um, between, between multiplicity versus um, the power of a single transaction. That is, we want a single transaction, should it appear somewhere in the system, to eventually settle. And that means that that as as long as a certain amount of time has gone by, even if transactions appear in all of the underlying blockchains, it it shouldn't be knocked out by those. And this parameter L sort of gives you the trade off between these these things. Um, and so, what are the salient features here? Well, any transaction will settle in about um, L time because there's this window of depth only L that um, is is used to determine who wins. Um, if a transaction should appear in say two thirds of the underlying ledgers very quickly, then that's going to be very hard for another transaction to knock out. And um, likewise, it's gonna be hard for another transaction to be inserted so deep that it messes this up. Okay, so hopefully that cartoon picture gave you something to walk away with. Um, I guess since time is tight, I won't talk about the M for one proof of work and um, just give you finally an advertisement for Peter Ghazi's totally beautiful talk, um, which um, actually discusses all of this in more detail and say thanks for listening. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, we already have a question on the chat, so Juan, you can ask. Um, hi, Alex. So, what's the, you, you also have another paper on parallel chains and the uh, e-prints that they subsume that one? Or? Oh yeah, this subsumes this subsumes that one. Um, that one, um, yeah, that one uh, tried to do a little more. I mean, um, it also tried to say something interesting about. Um, about bandwidth. And actually one thing about the construction here is that it really doesn't give any particular improvement on bandwidth. If everybody wants every transaction to settle fast, then they're sort of injecting the transactions into all of the underlying ledgers. And that means you get no, no bandwidth improvement. Okay, thanks. Okay, do we have other questions? I see by Yogos, you can ask. Yeah, so hi, Alex. So you said you get this uh, small confirmation time, let's say, for conflict-free transactions or something like that. I'm not sure the, the, about the term you use. So what about non-conflict-free transactions? Do you believe it's possible to actually get uh, that good confirmation time? Or do you think it may be actually impossible to, to do that? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, and I... I would guess that it's actually possible to do. Um, and um, 
And actually, now that you have said it out loud, it would be interesting to know what, what, um, uh, what would happen if you really looked carefully at PRISM. So there's independent work, uh, PRISM, and um, it, they share a lot of the, they share a lot of conclusions um, with our work. They, they get um, expected constant time settlement, but I wonder if one looked carefully at their work and you know, really tried to um, achieve constant settlement with all but negligible probability, if maybe it could be done there. So they have, an, they have the advantage that um, they work with an explicit protocol where you know, all of the blockchains are coordinating. And um, so maybe if you actually give yourself the, the benefit of working with kind of an explicit protocol, not a black box reduction that treats all of the sub um, ledgers as black box objects, maybe you could do more there and maybe that would be the route to take. We actually Thanks. can try that. It doesn't seem likely. Oh, really? Okay, <laughs> great. It sounds like no, you know no, more about no, it than no, I do no, then. No, not approved. Okay, so I also have a question. Um, in your uh, combiner, you take uh, multiple, several blockchains. So um, in terms of uh, assumptions, do you need um, assumptions of how many to hold? Um, of uh, of how, many, how many blockchains are fed into the construction? And do you need that uh, the assumptions of all underlying blockchains will hold or? Ah. Okay, yeah, great. Um, so I, um, I didn't talk about this in detail. So the, the um, sort of most exciting conclusion I think of the paper is one that works under the assumption that all of the underlying blockchains have like linear consistency. Um, so, you know, over time, um, as those blockchains grow, the probability of, you know, um, ejecting a transaction that was like k steps back falls off exponentially, exponentially in k, and all of the underlying uh, blockchains have to provide a, a linear consistency like that in order for that um, for that construction to do its job. Um, we also experiment later in the paper with a sort of robustness combiner. That is, you know, what happens if you're in a situation where you, you have a family of blockchains and the adversary can just like completely dominate some subset of them. Um, and so we also we also sort of work out what happens if you explore natural ways to um, uh, to produce a target um, dynamic ledger from a bunch of subledgers like this. If the um, security of those subledgers can completely be destroyed for some minority of them, and you can still get some you can still get some control on you can still get some control on this. But so that's a different that's a different combiner. So it's sort of two combiners in the paper. Nice, thanks. Any other questions? We still have a bit more time if you want. If not, then we can move on to the next paper. Okay, this is about asynchronous Byzantine agreement with subquadratic communication. It's a paper by Erika Blum, Jonathan Katz, Chenda Liu Zhang, and Yuliendra. Yuliendra. And Chenda will give the talk. Okay, so do, do you hear me? Do you see the slides? Yes, thanks. Okay. Okay, so thanks, Ran, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm going, not going to define BA again. So, so when we think about applications uh, with a large number of parties, we want to understand how the communication grows in terms of the number of parties. And the goal of this paper is to investigate whether one can achieve low communication when the network is completely asynchronous. And this means that the adversary has full control over the network, but messages sent by honest parties are eventually delivered. And by low communication, we mean uh, subquadratic. And specifically, we investigate whether uh, there is such a subquadratic asynchronous BA that tolerates a linear number of adaptive corruptions. And to answer this question, we first give a, a feasibility result that uses a trusted dealer as setup and also assumes uh, secure erasures and an adversary that cannot take back uh, messages sent by honest parties. And secondly, we give an impossibility result that shows that we need some form of setup to, to achieve subquadratic communication. So previous subquadratic PA protocols like uh, the works by King and Saya, Nikali, or 
Abraham et al. are synchronous or partially synchronous. <clears throat> With the recent, uh, with, the, with the exception of the recent war by Cohen et al., which achieves a subquadratic asynchronous BA, but with the caveat that the adversary has some kind of restricted scale, scheduling power. And in particular, it cannot uh, reorder messages sent by honest parties in the same protocol step. So in this talk, I'm just going to sketch the feasibility. So the feasibility uh, relies on two building blocks. The first one is a one time. Byzantine agreement, which, which assumes some non-reusable non setup. The BA is subquadratic and has some small setup size depending on the security parameter kappa. And the second building block is an asynchronous MPC protocol that also has setup. And what the trusted dealer uh, does initially is to generate both setups. And the task of the MPC protocol is to emulate the trusted dealer functionality and generate the setup for the next uh, protocol invocation, meaning that this approach gives you um, support for unbounded uh, number of PAs in such a way that each invocation uh, is subquadratic. So maybe a few words about the first building block. So the one-time PA uh, protocol follows the traditional uh, feldman mikali approach of iterating graded con consensus, which is a weak form of agreement followed by a coin flip protocol. Um, <clears throat> so what we use is a player replaceable version of Canetti Rabin's uh, graded consensus to achieve subquadratic communication, meaning that instead of letting um, all parties send to all parties in each step, we, le we let a random subset of kappa parties, the committee sent to all parties at each step. And these committees are generated at the beginning of the protocol by the trusted dealer. And hence, the, uh, and these committees are unknown to the adversary, of course, and, and that's how we achieve subquadratic uh, communication. And the second block is an MPC protocol with L output quality. Um, L is the, the output quality is the number of inputs that are taken into account for the computation which in the case of an asynchronous network, the largest L that, that one can achieve is uh, N minus F. And the protocol uses a threshold FHE as a tool and follows the, um, the CDN approach, the Kramer, Damgar, and Nielsen approach, or perhaps more precisely is based on uh, Cohen's protocol, which is based on, on this approach, but in the asynchronous setting. And the idea is that parties first uh, encrypt their inputs uh, using this FHE, uh, the public key, and then they jointly agree on a common subset of encrypted inputs, and then each party locally evaluates uh, the function to compute using this ciphertext uh, to get to a common output ciphertext, which uh, they jointly decrypt. And in our protocol, uh, a designated uh, committee is in charge of decrypting this ciphertext. And the committee is generated uh, by the trusted dealer who also generates uh, the, the, the keys for the FHE scheme. It generates the public keys and it also generates Kappa decryption shares. And each party in the committee has one of the decryption shares. Um, and then these guys in the committee um, decrypt the final ciphertext. And the setup also includes an encryption of a random value which contains the random bits of the function to, to evaluate. And one can see that then the communication complexity depends on the output quality. The more inputs one takes into account, the larger the communication complexity. And in general, if, if one has a linear um, output quality, the communication complexity would be quadratic. But uh, luckily for us, uh, for the case of trusted dealer functionality, uh, functionalities, the function to evaluate only takes as input uh, random bits. So, uh, and actually the ACS step is not even needed. So the, the, uh, the size of the setup would be poly of kappa and the communication complexity is subquadratic, which is uh, what we needed. So I omitted a lot of details, which one can find in the paper, but here, here is the, the full version. Thanks a lot. Um, do we have any questions? So, 
in your protocol, you assume, if I understand correct, um, several things. You rely on secure erasures and on fully homomorphic encryption. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if you, I think also uh, non-interactive zero knowledge, and I wonder if you can, uh, if you looked into reducing those assumptions. Mm -hmm. Is there any barrier in achieving a similar result under weaker assumptions? Um, yes, so, okay, so, so first the FHE assumption, I think it, this one could be reduced. Okay, if, if, one, um, if the circuit is sublinear, then you can use kind of um, the CDN trick of using one-sided uh, beaver triples, right? And, and, and something like this could, uh, with something like this, you, can, you could reduce from threshold FHE to threshold uh, homomorphic encryption, right? But only additive. Um, the erasure step, I don't see how to, how to reduce this, right? Because after you send you, I mean, because the adversary is adaptive, whenever you send the adversary can always corrupt you and you don't want to still have the, the secrets, right? Um, Non-interactive zero knowledge is interesting because um, I don't immediately see how to reduce this either. Because the point is that, is that our protocol uses uh, somehow that each party only speaks once, right? Like you create your next, uh, your messages, you erase them and then you send them around and you don't need to do anything else. If the zero knowledge protocol is known, is actually interactive and requires several uh, rounds of interaction, then, then the adversary could do something like uh, you sent uh, the, the first message and immediately kind of corrupt you and, and things will, will go wrong, I guess. Yeah. Mm. So the FHE assumption, I think one could reduce the other two, maybe, but I don't see how. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Any other questions? So we can move on to the final talk of this session on the security of time lock puzzles and time commitments. And this is by Jonathan Katz, Julian Loss, and Jiao Xu. And Jiao will give the talk. Okay, great. So um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. Um, first of all, let me introduce time cryptography. Um, I think this was actually discussed in a previous talk by Jun Wan. And so let me just briefly recap. So timed cryptography uh, involves some tasks that take some prescribed time to complete. And what I want to stress is that there should be no parallel speed up. So even if you have access to a parallel computer, you still need time T to complete the task. And for the assumptions in time cryptography, of course, um, traditional assumptions, such as say the uh, hardness of discrete log simply uh, don't fit here. And instead we need some problems with mild hardness, which means that you can, uh, you, you can solve the problem if you are given time T, but you cannot solve it any faster. And this is the so-called time lock puzzles. So one of the most widely used time lock puzzles in time cryptography is the RSW puzzle introduced by uh, Reverse Shamir and Wagner in 1996. So the puzzle is like this. Um, given a random group element G, compared G to the power of 2 to T. And of course, um, if the group order is known, then you can compute G to 2 to T fast because you can first compute 2 to t about the group order and then compute g to that thing instead of g to 2 to t directly. So we need to work in a, a group with unknown order, such as the quadratic residual group, QRN. So the RSW assumption says that um, computing uh, g to 2 to t in fewer than t steps is as hard as factoring n. And there's also a decisional variant uh, which says that even distinguishing G to 2 to T and a random group element in fewer than T steps is still as hard as factoring N. So of course, a decisional RSW is stronger than RSW. 
So we want to uh, analyze the RSM assumption in some idealized model. So our first contribution is to propose to introduce a new model called the strong algebraic group model. Um, so recall that uh, the algebraic group model, the AGM, is like the following. Um, an algorithm, whenever it outputs a group element, it must also output a so-called al algebraic representation of this group element, which is how this group element is computed via existing group elements previously seen by the adversary. And our strong AGM is really just a quantitative version of the AGM. And the strong AGM stands between the AGM and the general group model, just as the AGM stands between the standard model and the general group model. So in the strong AGM, the algorithm must output the entire path of the computation. And in particular, whenever the algorithm outputs a group element, it must also, um, it must also show how this group element is computed according to uh, previously seen or previously output group elements and using basic group operations. And the basic group operations include multiplication and inverse. And the difference between the strong AGM and the AGM is that in strong AGM, we have the, uh, we have the notion of set or time. And this is suitable for analyzing time, uh, time log puzzles. So with this uh, strong AGM, we prove that the RSW assumption holds. And we also have a, a complementary result, which says that uh, it is impossible to prove the RSW assumption in the plain AGM. So this uh, can be seen as a separation result between the AGM and the strong AGM. And uh, we also show that decisional RSW assumption implies uh, a primitive called timed public key encryption. So timed public key encryption is, uh, can be used as a timed variant of standard public key encryption. So the difference is um, even without uh, uh, the secret key in timed encryption, uh, you can still decrypt, but, uh, uh, but you need the prescribed time T to decrypt. So with decisional RSW, you can uh, construct a CPA secure timed public key encryption, which is Alcomar like. So uh, the public key is uh, N. Recall that we work in the quadratic residual group QRN. And the secret key is a factorization of N. And to encrypt, you first choose a random group element, and then a random group element R. And then you uh, compute the message times uh, R to 2 to T. And to achieve CCA security, we can do a now young paradigm, which is um, you use two pairs of keys and you, uh, you encrypt the message twice. And then you use a simulation sound, non-interactive self-knowledge proof to prove that um, these two ciphertexts correspond to the same uh, plain text. So we show that uh, uh, this, this encryption scheme shown here uh, is uh, CCA secure. So the, the proof is very similar to the original non-young proof, but there are some subtleties here. And with this uh, time public key encryption, we can also construct a so-called non-interactive time commitment. Uh, so this was introduced by uh, Bonnet et Noor in 2000. So in a, a time commitment, a committer, a committer um, signs a commitment as well as a commitment proof. And the receiver um, with this commitment proof can verify that the commitment corresponds to a message in time fast. So this is the commitment phase. And in the decommitment phase, the committer can reveal the message uh, and also send a decommitment proof. And with these two, um, the verifier, again, in time first, uh, can verify that uh, the 
the message corresponds to the commitment. But on the other hand, if the committer refuses to send the, uh, refuses to decommit, then uh, even without the message, the, the, uh, the receiver can still do a so-called false decommitment algorithm, uh, which recovers the message. But this will take, take time slow, uh, the prescribed time t. So this is how uh, time commitment works. So with um, timed public key encryption, we can uh, construct a non-interactive -inter timed commitment uh, almost trivially. So to commit, you can just encrypt the message. Um, and you also prove that the message is computed correctly. And uh, in commitment verification and decommitment verification, uh, you just verify the proof. And to do false decommitment, uh, you just decrypt and then you can recover the message. So to summarize, uh, this paper uh, has three major contributions. So the first one is we introduced an idealized model called the strong algebraic group model. And this can be viewed as introducing the notion of step or time in the algebraic group model. And the second contribution is uh, we present one of the first hardness results uh, about the RSW assumption in the strong, uh, in the strong AGM. So there's a concurrent work in, uh, I think this is Crypto 2020, and they also analyze the RSW assumption, but uh, it is in the generic green model. And finally, um, we construct non-interactive timed commitments based on decisional RSW assumption. And along the way, we also, uh, we also construct CCA secure timed public key encryption. Yeah, so this is the end of my talk. Our paper is on imprint. You can check it out if you are interested. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for your talk. And we have quite a few questions on the chat. So I think um, the first one was by Juan. Can you ask? Yeah, uh, can you compare this uh, SIGM assumption to the Monet in our assumption, this uh, generalized BBS assumption? Um, yes, so um, um, I think, um, yeah, if I, if I got it correctly, I think uh, GBBS is stronger than decisional RSW. Um, Mm, because mm, because GDBS basically says that um, you cannot distinguish G two 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 T from random, even if you are given some intermediate group elements, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you cannot distinguish from a quadratic residue if you have any other value, right? Okay, so. Yep. So the next question was from Sakib Kakvi. Uh, Sakib, do you want to ask the question? Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. It was really nice. So uh, can you give sort of a brief intuition why this RSW is impossible in the AGM? Because I mean, from my perspective, it seems like it should be, you should be able to do it, but. Um, so you are asking about this impossibility result, right? Yeah. Can you give like a quick intuition or is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, uh, the intuition is that um, the, AGM, the AGM doesn't really have the notion of uh, time or step, right? So mm -hmm. here, uh, recall that it's in RSW, your task is to output G222T, given G. Okay, so an algebraic adversary can just output uh, G222T. Um, as well as its algebraic representation, which is just the integer two to t here, and, and that is that's it. So this algebraic algorithm uh, can solve this puzzle in just a single step. Ah, okay. So this is considered as a single step in this model, and you don't like in the so you don't consider every computation he takes to be a single step, and that's where the strong model you have to show every step. So that's how you can count the time. Is that the yes, yes, exactly. Okay, okay, thank you. That's great, thanks. Great. 
We have another question by Yogos. Yogos, you can ask. Yeah. So the strong uh, ATM model sounds quite strong in the sense that you also reveal the explanation of, uh, of the element produced, if I got it right. Have you thought about weaker models, for example, hiding the explanation or part of the explanation and instead I don't know, providing some proof that it is correctly computed as you, as, you, as you want anyway? Have you thought about weaker models at all? Yeah, so um, um, I, I agree that the strong AGM is, uh, is quite strong. And to be honest, I think it is uh, actually already quite close to the general group model. Um, but, but because of this uh, impossibility result that you, you cannot analyze the R sub assumption in the AGM. So it, um, we, we, for now, we don't really know uh, how I mean, we need to come up with some other models between the AGM and the general group model. And the strong AGM is, a, is the only one we, ca uh, we can think of for now. Great, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, so we can... We have some time if anybody has a question to any of the talks that we had in the session. Yeah, I have, I have a question that relates to, to this last paper and also I think the third paper on, um, yeah, on Byzantine uh, broadcast uh, agreement. Um, so you, you introduced this notion of timed public key encryption and I'm wondering how it relates to time lock encryption. Um, so my, my intuition is that time lock encryption um, does not support, doesn't have a secret key, but I let you answer. And, and also I mean, the, the follow-up question would be, can you relate those two um, notions to each other? Can you build one from the other and uh, or are they kind of equivalent? Can you build one from the other or, or not? Yeah, so um, from my understanding, I think there are several different notions of uh, time lock encryptions. Um, I believe at least one of them is uh, the same or similar to our time public key encryption. Um, and I think um, there is another, uh, let's see, there is another uh, notion of time lock encryption, which is uh, you also support uh, fast encryption, uh, which is if you have the secret keys, then uh, you can encrypt fast. But if you don't have the secret keys, then you can only encrypt slow. And there, there might be some other notions of time lock encryption. Uh, as you said, uh, like you, 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 you don't have the public key, right? It, it is an analogy of the of a symmetric encryption. Um, yeah, I, I'm not really sure about the relation between these different notions. So maybe um, so... a question to the other speaker. Um, do, can you can you use this uh, kind of time public key encryption to build your scheme? Uh, Chen, Chen Da, I think was the, speak, the speaker. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think so. Um, I think the notation of these two models, at, at least from what I have heard in. Jiayu's talk, it, it seems like they're very similar. And I, I would guess that it's possible to do that. So I think at, at least in our case, we only, we use time lock puzzle as a black box. Like we didn't analyze it to the details as it was in the last talk. But I think uh, what they talk about in the last talk matches what we want for the black box. Okay. Okay. I have another question for you, John. Um, in your results, we, so you have two results about adaptive security. And the question is if you rely on secure erasures in your protocols. Uh, do you mean like, uh, what, what do you mean by secure erasure? Do you mean like the, the security if parameter? If you use um, some random coins to generate an encryption or for the time of puzzle, if it's a uh, user and coins, then do you rely on erasing those coins before a party gets corrupted? Yeah, yeah, sure. 
So I think for the first one, we, we need to use, in order to select the leader, even in the case of a weekly adaptive adversary, we need to use verifiable random function. So, uh, and we need to, uh, so there is, you're right, there is a chance actually that, so first of all, um, if let's say if the adversary managed to break the verifiable random function, then as, as you mentioned, then they could just corrupt the leader. So in this case, our protocol will fail. So there's a chance of probability, failure probability here. But <laughs> there's all, another, another thing is that there's a possibility that honest user, even though when they use verifiable random function, they do not agree on who the leader is. But in this case, I think we're fine. This is, this is in this case, like this, at this, this ad hoc, we're not, we will not reach agreement, but everyone will still continue and they will still get agreement in the end. So I don't think this is a failure probability. And uh, for the second one, I think um, uh, we also need to use this type of uh, verifiable random function, but this is like, this is just depends on the protocol. We applied the age-based sampling protocol to, for example, chain it tells work, they use uh, this randomness generation. And I think uh, our using our protocol doesn't change the security analysis in their protocol. Yeah. I remember that there's a result of Elaine and others that uh, managed to achieve um, this idea of the VRF without secure erasures. I wonder if that can be applied also in your results. Mm. I see. So I think if you're referring to if you're referring to the to Chan Intel's work, I think they they achieved that because they elect a committee and each member has a fair chance to be in it. So it doesn't really matter. Like if you corrupt a verifiable random or if you manage to pre predict it, it just means you, it's, it's similar to how you corrupt one user. So in this case, like just uh, getting one honest user doesn't really matter here. So I think it should still work for our second paper, but uh, I think for the first paper, actually managed to predict in verify for random function could be a trouble. Yeah. Okay, do we have any other questions? Um, not necessarily a question, but to go back to Markle's comment about how the last results time PKE relates to TLE. Um, my understanding is that it's very close to what we achieved for, or what we won from time lock encryption from our 2018 paper. So from what I heard, it seems very similar. Comment I want to make. Great, thank you. So if we don't have any further question, we can thank all of the speakers of the session again. And thank you also, Malkov. Yeah, thanks everyone. And uh, I think there's a, there's a social event now in um, gathered 